Okay, um, welcome um, all of you to today's um, webinar on thoracic surgery during the COVID-19 pandemic organized by the Southeast Asian Thoracic Society or in short called SEATS. I am uh, Dr. Agastian, I'm the chairperson of this webinar. I'm also happen to be the president of SEATS. I would just like to say a few words on SEATS. Uh, uh, SIDS is uh, the Southeast Asian Thoracic Society, and if you look at SIDS, if you look at Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia comprises about 10 ASEAN member states. And those of you who don't know what ASEAN is, ASEAN is uh, actually Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And um, as a group, ASEAN has the third largest population in the world uh, with about 650 million people and has the third largest economy in Asia and the seventh largest economy in the world. It's much bigger than EU. And unfortunately, um, the rapid growth of economic success comes with it, the heavy burden and prevalence of chronic diseases, especially lung diseases like COPD and lung cancer. And in the ASEAN region, one of the, it has one of the highest COPD and lung cancer prevalence rates in the world, mainly due to the high incidence of smoking in the region. You can see, uh, you can see on the graph that many ASEAN countries are among the highest, have among the highest incidence of smokers in Asia and in the world. To address, so you can see here, the smoking rates in ASEAN and in a lot of the ASEAN countries, one of the highest incidence smokers in Asia and in the world. Therefore, to address some of these prevalent critical lung health issues, SEEDS was formed by a representative group of thoracic surgeons from the respective ASEAN member states in December 2019 with a secretariat based in Singapore. And the primary aims of SEEDS is to improve the standard and care of general thoracic surgical patients by promoting innovative cost-effective treatment and strategies. It is also to uh, form a common platform for education and training of surgeons in the region and to collaborate and promote research activities in thoracic diseases common in the region. And as a startup society, CIS membership is very important. And, uh, it is a one-time life membership payment, and it's open to all ASEAN and non-ASEAN surgeons, and anyone who has interest in general thoracic surgery. And those of you who want to be members, which I encourage strongly, please apply for membership at this uh, website, www.seeds.org. So I come to today's um, uh, talk or webinar, which is on thoracic surgery during the COVID-19 pandemic and ASEAN experience. I'll be chairing the, um, the session. The first speaker will be Dr. Edmund Leroman from Lung Center of Philippines. He'll be talking on perioperative techniques to minimize spread of COVID-19 during thoracic surgery, followed by Dr. Punarak from Sriraj Hospital, who will be talking on transitioning the hospital out of the pandemic Southeast Asian perspective. Just before you start, I'd just like to have a few webinar housekeeping rules. Those claiming CME points can write to the secretariat at, sec at this email, secretariat at seeds10.org. All participant mics will be muted throughout the webinar. Questions for the speakers will be directed by written messages on the chat or Q&A icon by the screen. And all question and answers will be done after both speakers have finished their respective talks. Participants can also email their questions directly to the speakers due to time constraints, which I've given both speakers email. And participants are encouraged to stay till end of the session as there'll be a short update on Seed School of Thoracic Surgery and upcoming webinars by Dr. Sun, by Dr. Sun Sin Yang. And I also like to, on behalf of the society, to thank Medtronic for the educational support of this and further upcoming webinars. Thank you. I'll now pass it to Dr. Edmund to start his talk.
Good evening. Welcome to the SEATS webinar. I'm Dr. Edmund Villaroman. I'm a thoracic surgeon from the Lung Center of the Philippines and at the St. Luke's Medical Center. Tonight I'll be talking about the uh, perioperative techniques to minimize the spread of COVID-19 uh, during thoracic surgery. I have no disclosures. Let me start my talk by presenting a case. This is a 63-year-old male, a chronic smoker with a squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, right lower lobe, and measured uh, 3.5 centimeter. He has a good pulmonary function. The preoperative stage is a stage 1B at T2A, N0, M0. And he has no other comorbidities except for an incidental finding of uh, interstitial lung disease on uh, the right lower lobe on CT scan. He was admitted at uh, Tonji Hospital and underwent VATS, um, right lower lobectomy with mediastinal lymph node dissection. The surgery went well. It was um, completed in about two hours and there was only minimal blood loss. Three hours um, after surgery, he developed fever, 38.5, followed by cough and myalgia. Uh, they did the repeat CBC showed uh, lymphopenia so they just continued the IV antibiotics. On uh, day two, post-op, there was persistence of the fever, now reaching 39, with shortness of breath. They did a, a chest CT scan, which showed atelectasis with consolidation and minimal pleural effusion. On the first, fourth day post-op, there was a worsening of the symptom. Um, they hooked him to a, a BiPAP, and did a CT scan, it showed ground glass opacity on uh, both lungs. Eventually, uh, he further deteriorated and uh, they did endotracheal intubation. They tested for COVID RT PCR, which was positive, and they started him on antiviral. His condition further de deteriorated on day five and he expired uh, after the fifth day post op. They reviewed the CT scan of the, this patient taken two weeks before the surgery, and they noticed uh, a subpleural ground glass attenuation in the right uh, lower lobe, which was interpreted then as an ILD. But because of the lack of awareness of the significance of uh, ground glass findings then, uh, they weren't aware that it was COVID. So this happened at Tonji Hospital in Wuhan, China. And the date was December 2019. This was uh, patient number one of that hospital, of Tonji Hospital. During the time, there was limited understanding of the, what the virus was and how it, it was transmitted. Patient one infected six other post-op patients that underwent VATS and lung resection for lung cancer. And three, out of the seven died with a 43% mortality, including patient number one. He likewise infected uh, eight um, health care providers uh, in that hospital. So fast forward to the present time, China has now about 85,000 80, 85, cases with about uh, 350 healthcare workers infected. And worldwide, we have now 6.7 million confirmed cases with about 90,000 healthcare workers. Unlike in December 2019, today we have a better knowledge of COVID-19 and we know that you know, the person-to-person the, the -person transmission most commonly happens during the close expo exposure to an infected person, primarily by respiratory droplets, uh, when they cough, when they sneeze, sneeze when they talk, and the transmission may also happen through contact uh, of contaminated surface. The contribution of small airborne particles, sometimes called aerosols or droplet nuclei, is uh, currently uncertain. The virus RNA has been isolated in, in, in exhaust uh, fans, in ventilation shafts, but it is unknown what's the significance of that. We as thoracic surgeons and respiratory physicians know that we, per we perform a lot of this airborne 
um, generating procedures. And these AGPs uh, are as follows. Endotracheal intubations, extubations, manual ventilation, suctioning, uh, BiPAP, CPAP, high-frequency oscillatory ventilation, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, chest visual therapy, nebulization, bronchoscopy, tracheostomy, surgery in which um, high-speed and energy devices are used, sputum induction, and others. And most of these procedures are, are procedures we encounter daily as, as thoracic surgeons, as respiratory physicians. And these aerosol-generating procedures put healthcare workers um, at risk for transmission of the infection. So I've been presenting preoperative, uh, intraoperative, and uh, postoperative strategies. So what will I will be discussing is based on institutional or uh, society or national guidelines that we have. So we have each of our own guidelines based on the burden of COVID-19 infection and the availability of the resources. So in our setting in, in the Philippines and in our institution, we, we follow this, um, this uh, screening and testing. So we do preoperative checklist uh, is, is required for elective cases that includes health declaration, any recent quarantine, history of travel, exposure to uh, COVID uh, patients and flu-like symptoms. So we do recommend that resolution of symptoms uh, uh, be done prior to any uh, elective surgery. And uh, patients should have an x-ray or, or a CT scan if there is within three days uh, prior to the procedure. With regards to um, COVID swab, um, we use either the RT-PCR or the, the gene expert. Uh, which uh, the, the results are available uh, with a gene expert in 24 hours for RT-PCR, it's about three days. Um, we require that the patients have a COVID test, a COVID swab within 24 to 48 hours, ideally, but it's acceptable to have it within two weeks. We usually do not um, recommend um, serologic tests, although it's cheaper and easier to perform as a point of care. Um, with the reason that it, it, it's, um, it may not be detectable within three days after the onset of symptoms or at least seven to 10 days after infection. So it's not very useful in the acute setting specifically for testing uh, patients uh, before surgery. So all patients should be approached as COVID-19 positive without the benefit of a swab. So regardless of the degree of the symptoms. And all elective thoracic surgery cases should be proven to have COVID-19 negative status. So if you're asymptomatic and you know, it's just a single negative COVID swab test uh, would do, if you have symptoms, then you have to resolve the symptoms first and have a single negative COVID swab. If you're a COVID positive patient before, uh, you need about two consecutive COVID-19 negative results. So... Uh, with regards to patient and hospital staff safety, uh, we have separate operating theaters, equipment, and staff for COVID-19 and non-COVID-19. So our COVID-19 ORs are converted to negative pressure rooms. Um, we should ensure adequate OR and, and uh, recovery room staff, adequate supply of your PPEs, and there should be a regular testing um, uh, using RT-PCR of, uh, of the surgical personnel. Uh, very important is to have a comprehensive hospital infection control policy to minimize the risk of transmission to patients and the hospital staff. That includes uh, doning and doping procedures with a trained observer, decontamination of instruments in the OR after surgery, and planned transport route. So um, I won't go into the details of you know, using PPEs and infection control protocols. We have to follow our own safety protocols uh, based on national uh, society or inst institutional guidelines uh, for each country. For intraoperative strategies, um, aerosol generating uh, maneuvers in thoracic surgery includes airway procedures or surgeries, including tracheostomy, tracheal surgery, bronchoscopy, bronchial transactions, management of air leaks such as lobectomies, bolectomies, fissure dissection or transection, and use of um, 
of um, electrosurgery and the use of uh, CO2 in insufflation. Small air filled sacks. So, with regards to uh, minimally invasive uh, or open surgery, there is little evidence um, of risk of minimally invasive, uh, particularly vascular robotics, versus conventional open approach specific to COVID 19. Of course, we, we know the proven benefits of minimally invasive surgery you know, having lesser hospital stay, which is very important during this COVID pandemic to, resort, uh, to try to um, uh, save resources. Uh, what one, one potential advantage is the ultrafiltration of majority of aerosolized particles uh, that we can do with MIS compared to if we do it open. So you could imagine if you do, for example, the cortication of the lung and you do, do it through vats, you, you, the, 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 the contamination of the, the field or the room is much less and better controlled if you do it through vats compared to doing it open. So there are concerns though with regards use of non-intubated vats or the knee vats uh, in which patients are managed under light sedation by oxygen and nasal cannula or face mask. And theoretically, of course this is not proven by studies, that the risk of virus diffusion through aerosol and droplets is higher compared to intubated patients with a closed uh, circuit ventilation. Previous research uh, has shown that the use of uh, CO2 insufflation can lead to aerosolization of bloodborne viruses, such as HIV and hepatitis B. Um, there is actually no evidence uh, to indicate that this effect is seen on uh, COVID-19, but erring on the side of safety, it would warrant us to assume that coronavirus might exhibit similar aerosolization uh, properties and we should take uh, proper precautions. And the recommendation, if you use MIS using CO2 insufflation, is uh, to use devices that filter uh, and release uh, CO2 for aerosol aerosolized particles um, should be strongly considered. This is, includes an example of the rapid vac system by Medtronic. Uh, the decision port, uh, if done, should be small as possible and should be beveled a bit wider from the skin going narrower inside to allow passage to the ports but not to allow leakage of your CO2. And at the end of the surgery or before converting to an open or removing the trocars, the CO2 should be uh, carefully released and evacuated and you, you should use a filtration system. With regards to risk of aerosol transmission in smoke plumes, previous research has shown that smoke plume with the use of laser and power devices can lead to aerosolization of viruses such as HPV and HIV. Again, there is no evidence uh, because of the lack of evidence uh, for COVID-19, but we would want to err on the side of safety in that we would want to assume first that uh, they might exhibit the same properties. So again, uh, what is uh, recommended, so like in this case, the typical plumes that you see um, generated by this uh, uh, advanced uh, bipolar. The recommendation is that one, electrosurgery should be set to the lowest possible setting for the desired effect. Two, use of monopolar electrosurgery, ultrasonic dissectors, and advanced bipolar should be minimized as these can, lead, uh, can lead to uh, particle aerosolization. So smoke evacuators must be used when using electrosurgery. With regards to use of frozen section uh, and the risk of, of COVID-19. So this is a big issue among pathologists uh, receiving frozen section. And this is because they know that you know, freezing temperature below um, minus 20 uh, degrees uh, centigrade does not kill coronavirus, but rather preserves it. Uh, the normal preservation uh, of viruses in laboratories is about uh, minus 20 to minus 70. So they're actually alive. So the recommendation uh, is that frozen section and examination must be performed only on patients where the procedure is expected to be to give an actionable diagnosis, meaning it, it, it will change the, the, the surgical plan you're doing. 
supervision and intraoperative intervention may be uh, life-saving. So of course, they have their, their own setup in, in the laboratory with regards to uh, having a negative pressure room and all the PPEs. Post-operative strategies, uh, one, one uh, strategy they utilize uh, for chest tube drainage because you know, we know the chest tube drainage systems do not contain viral filters. And with, with air leak, the aerosolized virus in the patient's lung may flow into the drainage system and out into the room uh, when you're on water seal and or in the, in the suction canister when you're on suction. So they have, uh, they have devised uh, using the, the high efficiency particulate air filter uh, and uh, you, this is a typical filter uh, that you use uh, for uh, ventilators. So they have adopted that and connected that to the suction port of uh, your uh, plural drainage systems. There are some have also recommended putting diluted bleach uh, in, in uh, the, the water seal. So long as you don't uh, put it back to the patient, uh, it, it's, uh, it's fairly safe. So one, one thing, uh, a perioperative strategy is uh, use of uh, enhanced recovery after surgery pathways or fast track protocols. Uh, we share collections of perioperative decisions to improve the outcomes and shorten the hospital stay of the patient. So we should, you should try to minimize the, 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 the number of days the patient is staying in the hospital uh, using the, this standardized evidence-based approach uh, to all perioperative management. Um, so a typical example of that is uh, a, a uh, enhanced recovery for lung surgery uh, in which uh, all are prepared uh, preoperatively from day one, day two, day three, until the patient goes home. Okay, so I think that's the last slide. Um, thank you very much for listening. Dr. Poon? Hi. Hello. Thank you, Evan. You see my slide? Okay. Yes, you see the slides. Yes, good evening, I'm Dr. Udura Trongchul and, and the Chief Physician of Cataract Surgery, uh, Faculty of Medicine, Sirat Hospital. And uh, my topic is about transitioning the hospital out of the pandemic, a Southeast Asia perspective. And first, I'd like to thank Edmund for uh, his uh, coverage of all about the COVID-19. And we all know that the this pandemic is affect not only the infected cases, uh, they also affect our healthcare personnel and, and the health, healthcare resources. And uh, regarding the strategy, I would like to uh, talk about the big picture. And so basically, the global strategy to respond to COVID-19 is to mobilize, control, suppress, reduce, and develop the prevention, which is a specific one would be the vaccines. And this is the, the strategy to respond to, to COVID-19. And if you look at the health system, and we can divide the response into four categories. The first is the response to public and about the disease control. Uh, the second one is the restaurant, restaurant from each hospital to building the fighting COVID hospital to treat the, the cases uh, coming. And then the third one is each hospital has to prepare for the long fight because this pandemic is last longer than we think. And the last one is to expanding the response 
not only treating the patient, but we have to uh, respond to other effects of the pandemic, such as the financial crisis, which is happening in, in many countries. So uh, I would uh, talk briefly on, on each, each area. So respond to public and disease control means that you have to control the uh, pandemic in your country. Have to have a good uh, teamwork with the other healthcare system, and to try to identify the patients, try to control the infection spreading, and then each hospital have to develop their own response. How can they cope with the number of patients coming? How many critical patients? Is the ventilator? The PPE is, is okay. Had the COVID that situation, so there is the hospital uh, responsibility. And finally, we know that it is going to be the second wave, third wave. Then we have to prepare to fight with this uh, long-term pandemic. And then the last one, which is. Uh, Sometimes we didn't realize that this is quite an important issue because with this pandemic, you know, everyone stay home, all the company are closed, then there will be some financial situation that we have to, to take care of. And the supply chain of each hospital is short. So we have to expand our response not only for the patient, for the people, but for those things as well. And there's a the brief about the, the response. So after everything is getting better, then we have to move forward. So it starts from how well you respond to COVID in each country, in each hospital. And then it also depends on what is your new normal vision. You have to review all the aspects of COVID effect then you will know how to transition into the next level. But the mindset is that when the COVID-19 pandemic is over, healthcare must not return to business as usual, but we have to turn to the new normal healthcare business. So it is dependent on, on each country, each hospital, each healthcare system. What is your new normal? And we have to achieve that. Uh, we divide the priorities of transitioning into five priorities. The first one is about patient, uh, the people safety, and how you get your healthcare workforce to engage and uh, get everything done as you plan. The second thing is about the how to uh, reshape the strategy for business continuity. We all know that our business has been disrupted and you know we have to shut down the OR, we have to do so many things that our business is not as good as before. And after COVID, everything is not the same anymore. So we have to reach it to to the, the possibility of each hospital for their own business have to be changed and according to the a response that they have. The third thing is to communicate with the relevant stakeholders, not only the patients, but also the, uh, like in Thailand, we have to have communicate with the payer, the government regarding budget and everything. We all know that financial crisis has been occurring in many countries. I think most countries, the budget and support from the government, from the payer, will be reduced. So we have to use all that budget as good as possible. Then the last thing is we have to prepare for the new normal, not going back to what we have been. So we have to set up our mindset, what is our new normal should be. Okay. Uh, we talk about the, how to, to 
uh, do with the patient, the people safety. We all know that in some countries, uh, healthcare workforce has been destroyed. Uh, like in Italy, in US. So we have to make sure that that won't happen again. So the safety and well-being of the employee, I mean the nurses, the doctors, the workplace is very, very crucial. Lack of the workforce, we cannot do anything. This is the something that the executive have to set up the guidance and concern more about the employees. And it is not only the health status of the employee, it's we have to take care of everything, the financial problem. Some of these make your nurses and your uh, worker sick. And so you have to, to uh, be very careful on this point. Remote work from home, work remotely is, has to be introduced. And I think that that will change the idea of uh, how the hospital work. We are lucky that nowadays the digital technology is very, very advanced. So when the COVID pandemic occur, I think we can uh, adapt ourselves into the flexible work arrangement very well. So for employee safety, even the pandemic look uh, getting better every day, but we have to still aware of the second and the third wave that is coming. In, in Thailand, we predict that the second and third wave will happen this year again. So we have to adapt our workplace to uh, be ready for the next wave of the pandemic that is like coming this year. We have to uh, redesign our workplace, keep distancing, how to protect our people. And the next thing is about the other support. Like in Thailand, we have uh, experienced that one of the common stress for the nurses is their family's members lost their jobs. So they are very, very, uh, have a very high stress on that. So to transition from the uh, pandemic to the new normal, we have to change the way we run the business, all the meeting should introduce the IT technology, working remotely, using the Zoom, the webinar, the WebEx, Microsoft Teams, there are many, many platforms that you can choose. You can see that many, many companies, they give their employees the option to work from home until at least the end of this year. So there is quite a big change for the hospital uh, business. It is very common for the IT company, but for us, it is one of big change. Or even the shift, introduce technical shifts and all hours. Does mean the employee, the nurses, are start and finish and the break time are different for each worker. That, that will keep the distancing between the worker and it's good for us. So this uh, idea of the office, introducing some concept like the six feet office to uh, design that everybody is keep the distancing from each other and design the office so that they can work from home more convenient. How about the place where we have to face with the patient, the outpatient, inpatient, and the operating theater? 
for the outpatient, the design of the workplace is to protect the nurse and the doctor from the patient who can be infected. So usually this is the photo from my clinic. This is my resident. So he has a screen shield to protect him. He wearing the mask and sometimes the face shield as well. So it is a high risk department, like in a screening clinic. So in that department, is the protecting surgery should be very high. But for the surgery clinic, I think we can uh, just have only mask, face chill, and protein screen is okay. For the inpatient and the urban theater, for the patient coming for surgery, and we have to set the protocol. The swab is, and the CT chest is necessary or not. For the swab, I think right now in the most hospital that resumed that service, the swab for the COVID prior to the operation is very, very important. But how about the CT chest? Uh, this is a guideline from the Royal College of Virgin UK. So for this guideline, the routine CT chest for every procedure is not necessary. But for thoracic surgery and other complex abdominal surgery that need, may need the ICU. So the CT scan is still helpful. So in many units, uh, not only the swap for the COVID will be done before surgery. We will do the CT scan of the chest for the patient undergoing the chest surgery as well. What is the other new normal or most of the ring theater, they, they adjust the pressure in the room to be the positive pressure. But when we have to COVID, the COVID, then we have to change that into the negative pressure theater. So the best thing is to redesign your ring theater to be able to adjust the in-room pressure to be neutral, positive or negative. The buffer area should be available with direct access to shower room. So we have to, to redesign our, our complex. And the other thing is to reduce the number of people uh, coming into the theater, digital technology should be integrated like you have the AR, the VR technology. So you don't need to go into the theater every time you get consulted. You can give the consultation from remote area. The other area that is very critical is the intensive care unit. So we have, we need more spaces for the intensive care unit. We need the buffer area, we have to uh, redesign the ventilation of the room to make it negative pressure or positive pressure as we want. The MI2 side is also very important. The self-protection strategy, either it is on the job or off the job, is to be concerned. Because most of the healthcare personnel in Thailand that was that were infected. They were infected from home, not from the hospital itself. So cell protection surgery should be applied both on the job and off the job. Now in Thailand, for example, we are now uh, resuming our service in many, many hospitals. We have the big cleaning day. We have to invent many, many things to uh, make sure that our doctors and nurses are safe. The next part is, it is about the reaching the strategy for the business continuity. This pattern is not disruption. So most of the health cabinets is underperformance. One of the reasons is the supply chain challenges. 
you can see that in many situation, staff and supply chain are in shortage. We are right now, even in Thailand, the lack of surgical mask is becoming a problem right now. If you talk about the full protection, two months ago in Thailand, it is like uh, the crisis is very, very strong. So we have tried my, our best to get the, those, the full protection equipment from outside the country, which is very, very difficult because we all know that most of the resource come from China. And at that time, China is still very struggle to resume their service to supply all those equipment to other countries. When we are at transition to the new normal, we have to make sure that we have to communicate and talk to other stakeholders, which are patients, the payer, the suppliers. Because we have problem with some payers, the government have to reduce the budget. So we have to keep communication with those payers, how to survive after the pandemic with the half of the budget that we used to have. That is why I put this topic to maximize the use of the government and other organizations' support. The budget from government and from the board, the donation, the public cooperation will be reduced. The example is in Thailand. The major UMC hospital asked to prepare for budget reduction by 50% for two years. So that is the by the big issue, how can we survive with the teaching the medical students, treating the complicated patients and doing research work with a budget is low for two years. Fortunately, in during the pandemic, there are lots of donations coming from public. So we have to make use of that money as good as possible. And to reduce the cost and get the same outcome, it is quite a difficult part. The last thing I think is, it is about you to build, uh, to prepare for the new normal. So the new normal service is uh, based on the revised plan, which is based on what we have after the pandemic. The first thing is you have to assess what is left after the COVID pandemic. And then you have to make sure that you have the plan to continue your business with a good preparation for the next wave of pandemic coming. You have experience from the past that your continuity plan is good enough or not. If there, if there are something wrong, you have to identify root cause that and take an action to prepare for the next one. Optimal new normal, define your own new normal and develop the pandemic business continuity plan to make sure that you can continue your new normal business no matter how many waves of the pandemic is coming. One of the most talking is about to integrate the digital technology into the healthcare system. 
we are not saying that everything should go digital, but it makes sense to make digital anything that's not more efficient in the real life if possible. And this digital technology is very efficient in terms of to protect the healthcare personal safety. And I think it is the opportunity that we can put all the organization focus behind the digital agenda to it and, and to create a truly transformed enterprise from the front to the back office. I know that in, in, in ASEAN country, this digital transformation is very, very expensive, but this time that we have a good reason to integrate that digital transformation into our healthcare system. So the health home message is that to transition the hospital out of the pandemic is depend on how you respond to the pandemic and how to start transitioning is very challenging because if you resume your service too early and you are not ready for the second and third day, it will be disaster. The key area to concern is about, the first thing is about the people's safety, our doctor, our nurse. And then it is about the business continuity, the plan, the preparation. The third thing is about how to maximize the budget that we got from government or from the support from the nation to make your business run with the outcome as good as it should be. And to preparation for the new normal, I think one of the key is to integrate the digital technology into your healthcare service. So I know that it is quite uh, difficult in terms of the budget that we've got. But there are now, I think, for example, in Thailand, there are many, many industries that are coming to help you. We have a connection with the engineering institute. We have a connection with the company that have a lot of budget to support us. It's time to start talking to the other industry for good cooperation to make sure that we can transition to the transition to the new normal will be achieved. So this is all I, I would like to summary for you now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Punarak and uh, Dr. Edmund for the uh, very comprehensive and excellent talk. There are a couple of questions. I think the first question is for Dr. Edmund. Dr. Daniel from Indonesia wants to ask you, which is better, negative pressure in the OT or suction or smoke evacuator? Can you answer that question? Well, it, it would be better if uh, you actually have both. Because uh, um, even if you have a negative pressure, uh, well, using, using, a, using a filter device, uh, when you use uh, CO2, or uh, when you use, uh, you know, to evacuate smoke plume is, is different. Um, so in, in general, uh, the, the negative pressure room uh, uh, protects the entire room uh, from, uh, from contamination by the virus. But specifically, because the, the smoke plumes uh, and the CO2s are, uh, the, the, the surgical team is directly in contact this and uh, of course uh, it's assuming they're wearing also the proper PPEs but it, it's more of complementary and it's not uh, one or the other yeah so if you have both it would be it would be ideal thank you the next question is for Dr. Punara uh, Dr. Nabil wants to ask you what basically what is he asking is what's what is the experience with telemedicine during COVID COVID-19 uh, for my experience, um, because uh, we 
have uh, some connection with the other hospital, but this is not tele surgery. It is only telemedicine. So we have uh, like a meeting uh, over the uh, across the network to the other hospital. But I think what we should go for now is not only the ordinary telemedicine, but we should go for the tele surgery. We should go for the high quality like the VR, the AI in the theater that the other consultant can uh, look at your operation and have the real time consultation. But uh, for this pandemic, it has not happened yet, but it, I know that there are many, many companies that try to sell this technology. Like in Korean, they are uh, studying this, this technology. This is quite very interesting. But of course, the cost is our concern. Uh, for uh, our experience, it is mainly on the telemedicine over the meeting, the consultation. Okay. And Thank the other one is uh, for the outpatient clinic that we try to uh, move from the face to face consultation to the uh, telemedicine. This is like you have to tablet for each doctor to and give the the uh, connection to the patient to log in and see the doctor through the the, the online. And there is another other thing that we have done. Thank you. Uh, next uh, question is yeah. is for Dr. Edmund. Uh, what is your approach uh, in urgent emergency cases? Do you wait for the PCR result before surgery? Oh, definitely for emergency cases, we've actually identified uh, procedures that uh, really doesn't require us to do COVID testing, especially for um, dire emergencies. Um, but we do get testing, and but we don't wait for, for, for the results to come out. And uh, um, we, we have to do these procedures in the um, COVID um, operating room theater, uh, which is um, ideally a negative pressure. You have to wear um, your, 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 uh, your uh, level four uh, PPEs for that. So we assume that these patients are all positive. Yeah, again, with what I mentioned in my slide is any patient with, without any COVID uh, swab test result is assumed positive and uh, they're, they're managed as, as such um, and placed at the uh, separate uh, uh, COVID operating room theater. Okay, thank you. The last question, I think due to time factor, uh, is from Dr. Anis to Punarak. Uh, anticipating a second or third wave, do you think we should change how we do elective surgeries? And what are your recommendations? Yes, I think this depends on the uh, each country situation, and uh, especially the supply chain and how you uh, like in in our hospital. We start our resume our service uh, quite late because of the lack of the the blood and the blood product in our blood bank. So it depends on this. If you have uh, limited resource, then your elective surgery should be modified a lot. But if you have a resource in hand, so then you don't need to, to change. But the, what, what is still uh, the big concern is first the, the protection of our nurses and doctors. So for if you are, if there are still, still some uh, infected cares in the area, then you, you need to do like the swab, the CT chest, and in the theater, I think you can follow what Edmund has shown us. For the chair that I would, would like to recommend is you have to uh, redesign your workflow and your work 
plus like the other the ICU to be adaptable. And that, that, I think that will be enough to prepare for the second and third wave because we, we think that the second wave is not that bad as the first one that we have. So I think it is, uh, you, we must prepare for the second and the third wave, but it is depend on each country's situation, I think. Thank you. I think uh, I'll just take one. Last, this is the last question. I think this is an interesting question. I think I'll ask Edmund to answer this. Have you recognized the need to establish COVID free hospitals to manage high risk patients? This is from Dr. Richard Thrado. Uh, COVID um, hospitals. Um, okay. Yeah. It, it, that, well, that would be ideal um, uh, to have uh, COVID hospitals. Um, and even separate non-COVID hospitals. But then the, the reality is that uh, hospitals cannot actually, well, at least in the Philippines, we cannot actually um, not accept um, non-COVID or COVID uh, patients um, who, are, who are coming to the hospital. So what we do is we segregate within the hospital, like in the lung center of the Philippines, about 60, 65% of the capacity of the hospital is uh, dedicated towards COVID patients, and we separated a different area for um, non-COVID patients, uh, which is about 35% of the capacity. So, um, yeah, it would be ideal to have that, but in reality, it's 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 more difficult um, than, uh, than than said. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think we're getting more and more questions. I think there's another interesting one. I'll take this as the last one. I think to both of you, whoever is experienced in this, can you answer this? Is the use of PAPR recommended and how is it justified? If, if, if you have one and you're, you're managing a, a, a COVID patient, then it would be best, it would be ideal to have the, that. It's uh, quite expensive though. Uh, I, I, have, I have my own, uh, it, it's not the expensive type, but I, I am using that particularly for known COVID positive patients. Um, yeah, so, but, but it, it has not been proven to be better than the usual, um, you know, wearing of, um, of um, N95 and, and uh, other gears, uh, which are less uh, expensive. Okay, thank you. Do you use the uh, airtight one or you just use like a face shield one? No, I, I use the one, the, the, the powered one to wear, and that um, you, 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 you can work for me be like uh, six, six hours, eight hours straight, uh, battery operated. Um, I, I, I feel it's more comfortable using it for longer periods of time because uh, it's not as, as hot as wearing just a regular uh, PPEs, uh, coveralls, because uh, you, like you have a blower, uh, those um, air inside and mist uh, like uh, when you get uh, really hot inside and you know the mist is going towards your shield and your goggles it's very hard for you to operate for longer periods of time so I find it more comfortable using a, a PAPR uh, in those uh, instances. Thank you Edmund. I think we have to stop here because of time constraint also, if you have questions, can email to Punarak and, um, and Dr. Edmund. I think I put up their emails for you. So please direct your questions to them to email. So the last few minutes, I will pass it to Dr. Soon to say a few words on uh, Seed School of Thoracic Surgery. Dr. Soon. Yep, okay. Um, let me just do my share screen. Are you all seeing this? Yes. Okay. Um, Welcome to the new normal of uh, learning. Uh, as you can see, the first slide just shows the stars in our universe. You know, what is the new normal like? Uh, no one knows what the new normal to uh, education is like. And uh, we just started our uh, seats uh, last year, our Southeast Asian Thoracic uh, Society last year. So this is really a great opportunity for you, the participants, to uh, join us on our uh, journey ahead. You know, what lies ahead 
is a the great unknown, uh, especially with the pandemic. So it is a great opportunity for you to sign up and uh, uh, participate uh, in this journey with us. So the website is www.seats10.org. So you have to add a 10 behind the seats because uh, I think the seats.org is taken by some uh, company selling uh, theater tickets or something like that. So I, I went online to find that. So you must add a 10 behind that. So this is a time of um, you know, uh, networking, of interaction over the uh, internet, and it allows you to also uh, learn from home. So this is our inaugural uh, webinar series. Uh, thank you to Medtronic again for partnering with us in starting this. So the this is our society uh, logo, and you can see that it comprises uh, of the 10 nations in uh, Southeast Asia, but our membership is open to all. So please uh, do uh, join us. So I'll briefly share with you what our plans is for the next 10 weeks. So we have definitive topics lined up for the next 10 weeks. So it is going to happen on a weekly basis, every Monday, eight to nine o'clock. Uh, Malaysian time or Singaporean time, obviously in different countries that uh, you are in, uh, is GMT plus seven. So we have lined up a lot of uh, different speakers uh, for you and uh, different topics over the next 10 weeks. But the majority of topics is going to be mainly concentrated on uh, lung cancer and resection of lung cancer in this first 10 weeks. The other topics we line up after this uh, first 10 weeks, uh, which I will share with you uh, in the future. So if you take a look uh, for next week, we have our pulmonary anatomy and development by Patun Kiat and our pulmonary physiology and assessment by Navid uh, Alam. Uh, from Australia. So we have quite a lot of uh, international um, speakers that is uh, lined up uh, for, uh, for our presentation. Following week, we have lung cancer screening and lung cancer staging and classification. Following that, we have a management of pulmonary nodules and GGOs and what you do in early stage uh, lung cancer, take our segment uh, versus lobectomy. Uh, and uh, management of uh, N2 uh, disease and lung cancer, and what do you do with the lymph nodes uh, when you perform a lung cancer resection? And you, uh, uh, Dr. Dalong will speak on the management of oligostatic uh, lung cancer, and also uh, there will be topics on palliative management of stage four. Didn't put a stage four uh, down for four for lung cancer. Then Dr. Uh, Professor Ito from Japan is going to is a it's going to speak to us on management of locally advanced lung cancer, sleeve or carina resections, and Anise is going to uh, uh, tell us more about difficult intraoperative uh, scenarios, like your calcified lymph nodes, your frozen chest, and uh, so on. So the last three weeks will be your management of secondary lung cancers, your management of benign lung tumors, establishing an enhanced recovery program, management of post-operative complications, congenital congenital lung disease, and congenital trachea surgery. So it's an exciting program lined up for you uh, over the next 10 weeks. We really appreciate you taking time to join us. We are in this journey of learning together and are getting used to this uh, new normal. Our website is just up and running uh, at, a, at a present moment. So please uh, have a visit. The content has been uh, populated uh, as we go along. We are a new society. So this this is a time for the thoracic surgeons in Southeast Asia to play a part in uh, advancing the care of uh, uh, thoracic surgery and also uh, improving overall lung health in uh, Southeast Asia. So I um, want to thank Medtronic for their uh, generous grant in making this uh, uh, possible. So um, with that, I thank you for your uh, time tonight. and. We would love to see you again next week. Uh, please uh, visit us on our website uh, when you have the time, or maybe after the meeting, you can have a have a go and uh, have a look at our, our website. Thanks. Prof. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sun. And, uh, yeah, so the last few words, I'd like to thank all the panelists. Uh, for for the excellent talk and their time and Dr. Soon for updating us. I hope all of you will sign up for membership of SIDS. 
and I hope that all of you will support us in the, all the webinars. And I hope to see you all uh, next week, same time, same place. And I have all of you have a very good evening. I also like to thank uh, Metronic and Michelle and everybody involved in making this webinar a success. Thank you and good evening and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.